Hello and welcome, comrades, to the Spectre of Communism podcast. Now, if you're a communist or a socialist, you've almost certainly been told at some point, yes, yes, your ideas are very nice, the problem is they're totally contrary to human nature. But is this true? What does this actually mean? To help us answer these questions, we have Ben Curry, who is a member of the International Marxist Tendency and a writer and editor for Marxist.com. Ben, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me, Joe. So, is it true, Ben? Is communism against human nature? Well, my answer to that would obviously be no, because uh, I am a communist, and if I thought that communism was against human nature, then it would be a bit of a futile exercise trying to build a communist organisation. But um, I suppose it needs a little bit more justification for, than that. Um, well, if you, if you look just empirically at the fact, the fact of the matter is that capitalism as a system has not really existed for more than three or four hundred years. I mean... You talk. You only need to go back 250 years to the Industrial Revolution. But even at the outside, capitalism as a, as a system has only existed for a few centuries. Our species has existed for hundreds of thousands of years, anatomically modern human beings at least for a couple of hundred thousand years. And the majority of the existence of our species um, has been lived under a mode of production which we would refer to as primitive communism. That is to say, a, a society, a tribal society, where you did not have private property, where you did not have commodity exchange, where you did not have money, the state, class division, the exploitation of, uh, of, of, a, of a, uh, an exploited class or uh, the oppression of women or any other groups in society. And this was how society existed for the majority of uh, human history until about 10,000 years ago, uh, when you had the emergence of class society for the first time. And that was very much connected to developments in the in the mode of production, particularly the rise of settled agriculture and the Neolithic Revolution, as it's referred to. Um, so obviously, it's quite clear that actually, if one system is closest to our nature, we will just take the system which we have lived under the majority of uh, humanity's existence, it would be communism, you'd have to draw the contrary conclusion. But in actual fact, if we look at the broad sweep of human history, we see that there have been many social systems that have come and gone. And there have been many social, there have been many moralities and, and ethical codes and legal systems uh, um, that have come and gone with those modes of production. And each has their, their unique characteristics. Um, each have their distinguishing features. If you go back 2000 years, um, it was regarded as not just perfectly moral, but actually the foundation stone of the entire established civilization was slavery. And, um, <clears throat> Actually, uh, Aristotle raised the question, is slavery moral? Uh, he was quite a, a man of quite great stature because of all the philosophers of the ancient Greek world, he was the only one to ask this question. And he, he answered it in the affirmative. It was morally acceptable. Mm. Uh, Later than that, Cato the Elder was famously very strict and harsh towards women and slaves. And he was regarded as a paragon of Roman virtue because that was the society, that was the morality that he inherited. And he represented it perfectly through a morality we would today consider to be abhorrent. Yes, and uh, in actual fact that we can say that the the ruling ideas in any society are the ideas of the ruling class and those ideas in, in ancient Greek and Roman society were the ideas of a slave owning class. That was the foundation stone of that of that social system was slavery. And in actual fact every ruling class has regarded its social system as being the most natural and an eternal uh, established fact. Um, because the interests of the ruling class are precisely bound up with the, the unchanging static nature of that, that that system is the only possible system. And they want to drive out the idea that, uh, that, that any other system is possible. Yeah, it's very convenient if you can convince people that the way the world is now, where you happen to be in charge, is the way things should be, according to our nature, according to God's will or what have you. Yeah, talking of God's will, of course, yes, under the, under the feudal system, which dominated Europe for a thousand years after the collapse of the Roman Empire. Uh, the entire social hierarchy on on earth was deemed to be a mirror of this of this of the hierarchy in heaven just like you had god at the top with his archangels and angels below them you had the king uh, well you had the pope the kings the princes and then at the very bottom of society the serfs so it was a perfect pyramid reflecting the the, the natural order of things you had your natural superiors and your natural inferiors and very unnatural for a serf or a peasant to try and move above their station Yes, exactly. Of course, you mentioned the oppression of women, but the notion that women 
should be in a subservient position in society. That's been a common feature throughout class society. And that's also held to be just a reflection of human nature. Of course, there are certain things I think it's worth bearing in mind that when we say that morality has changed, human nature has changed, and we'll come on to maybe in a second exactly the justifications for this idea that capitalism is the most natural system. But capitalism, of, of course, in its morality has a lot in common with systems that, that came before it. Um, the, 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 the oppression of women is, is something that precedes, long precedes capitalism and misogynistic and patriarchal ideas. They, they go back a long way precisely because their origins are much, much deeper. They go back to the origins of, of class society and all class societies have certain things in common. Um, they're all based upon private property. They're all based upon, uh, and therefore, when you look at the Ten Commandments, you know, thou shalt not steal, it's very much just as applicable to modern society as it was to ancient Roman slave society, because these are societies that are based upon the division of society into exploiters and exploited, into property owners and propertyless. And therefore, there's inevitably, of course, across human societies of all varieties, you do have, of course, certain things that remain static that, 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 that do not change. Um, or that uh, are common, for example, to the, all of the class societies of the last 10,000 years. But taking this dictum from the, you know, the, the written into the tablets of stone, this idea of uh, thou shalt not steal, um, it would make no sense whatsoever to the primitive communistic tribal societies that, um, that, that did not have private property. Yeah. So, for example, when the Europeans arrived as colonists in the Americas and they, and they entered into contact with certain uh, communistic tribes, um, when they asked those tribes to hand over certain objects, gold or whatever else, they would they would give them gladly. But then they would the, the same um, individuals, members of these tribes, uh, in contact with the Europeans, would get angry at the Europeans for not being for being possessive of of their uh, you know their property because the concept of private property did not exist for these peoples, and the the idea of the, this this possessiveness of the Europeans must have seemed like something extremely. Ex extremely strange, of course, to a society that knew nothing of private property, exploitation and uh, money and, and, and commodities and all the rest of it. Can we talk a little bit today about how the ruling class and their mouthpieces and their toadies justify capitalism's claim to reflect human nature, either an economic justification, the idea that human beings will always want to own things, that trade is innate to human nature, that wealth and the pursuit thereof is innate to human nature, or the idea that selfishness and avarice are written into our genes. Yeah, I mean, by all means, I think um, the, the idea, if we, if we s state that, that objection to communism, oh, the problem with communism is that it's against human nature. Well, the idea that capitalism is something that is completely in line with human nature is, uh, is by and large basically an analogy. It's the idea that you have the law of the jungle, this idea that nature is this very uh, you know, cruel, brutal, uh, short existence that uh, it's where you have animals, prey animals um, being hunted by predator animals and so forth. And just like you have the law of the jungle, you also have the law of the market in which the, uh, the, the weak are gobbled up by the strong. And uh, this, this idea, therefore, um, means that class division, exploitation, poverty, all of these sort of things are extremely natural. This was first formulated by the British political economist um, Malthus, who uh, famously came up with his law of population. And the idea was that we as a species are subject to the same law of population as the whole animal kingdom. That is, we will continually procreate at a geometric rate. So population will inevitably increase and therefore it will always outstrip the means of subsistence that exist. And as it outstrips that means of subsistence, you will get poverty. You will get um, all of the, uh, uh, the, the, the sores that we see in capitalist society today. This was written at the end of the 18th, early 19th century, in the midst of the Industrial Revolution. It was used to justify the existence of slums, the existence of massive poverty and so forth. And in the 1830s, his ideas were rolled out precisely to justify the existence of workhouses and poor laws, which basically imprisoned poor people into these uh, um, workhouses, these prisons, basically, uh, where they would get bare subsistence in order to uh, to, to basically discourage the working class from procreating because this is the horrors that you will you will encounter because of your procreation but we don't have poverty and misery uh, under capitalism as a result of overpopulation that is simply not the case the fact of the matter is the reason that you have this enormous poverty that exists is as marx explained the accumulation 
at one end of society of, uh, of, of tremendous wealth, uh, of riches and, and uh, property, implies at the same time the, 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 the concentration at the other end of society of tremendous poverty, ignorance, and, and all of the horrors that we see under capitalism at the other end of society. In other words, the poor are poor because the rich are rich. Um, capitalism depends upon the fact that the vast majority are expropriated from the means of production and a tiny minority are those that own the means of production. Um, and, uh, and in actual fact, the tendency of this system is towards overproduction, mm. to producing more than the working class can actually consume um, because th there is that constant downward uh, pressure on wages precisely in order to boost profit. So, so poverty and all of these sort of things, they don't come from, th there's nothing natural about it. It is, it is the lawfulness of this system but of course, that's not that. That is then projected onto the laws of, of of human history in general and of nature. But what do you say to those people who argue there must be a genetic component to human nature, which expresses itself socially? Yeah, that is a very common argument as well. We see, uh, particularly in the fields of uh, among certain biologists, and uh, particularly in the field of evolutionary psychology and sociobiology. This idea is put around that basically um, we are merely, I mean, this is the famous idea of Richard Dawkins, the, of his idea of a selfish gene. We have our genes and our genes are selfish replicators. They're just constantly trying to replicate at the expense of other genes. We are merely an automaton for replicating our genes and our selfish actions are merely a projection of our, the intentions of our selfish genes so within this uh this group of sociobiologists and, and so forth, people like E.O. Wilson and Dawkins, uh, there is a crude analogy with the natural world. So, for example, um, ant populations, for instance, will, uh, will will act in a way which is apparently selfless very... insofar as they will sacrifice themselves for the good of their, their, their colony or what have you. Um, and the fact of the matter is this does have a reproductive advantage insofar as um, all of them being, uh, you know, having sharing the same genetic material, they're basically... Um, it's their kin that they're helping to survive and therefore indirectly they are helping uh, their gen genes to pass on. And the idea is therefore that this is extended by analogy to uh, to human society. The idea that um, we merely help other people as a sort of, it's a sort of like misfiring of uh, of this kin selection. And it's, it would help us to pass on our genes to to selflessly act to save our children or to save our close relatives, for example. Uh, and we merely project that onto, uh, you know, uh, running, running into a house to save our cat or whatever. Right, it's yeah, just, it's exactly. Just a, it's a mistaken altruism that is that is nevertheless rooted merely in a survival impulse. Um, <clears throat> but this this same argument is used by people like Dawkins. And more recently by um, hardline reactionary cretins like Jordan Peterson, who will point to the fact that dopamine produces certain responses that establish hierarchy amongst lobsters and because human beings and lobsters share a common ancestor that's the reason that humans develop hierarchies and therefore hierarchies as he conceives it with you know the strong and the dominant at the top and the weak and vulnerable at the bottom is basically a reflection of genetic superiority or inferiority and perfectly natural yeah these these ideas this pseudoscientific justification for um the ills we see in society around us lead, leads to extremely um, reactionary conclusions. Not only is it used to justify precisely, also as as uh, Jordan Peterson talks about, that these hierarchies uh, exist because it is natural, it is in our genes for the strong to dominate the weak. You also see, for example, Dawkins, I'll just read a quote from him. He says, conceivably racial prejudice could be interpreted as an, an irrational generalization of a kin-selected tendency to identify with individuals physically resembling oneself and to be nasty to individuals different in appearance. Now, if you take a, as good coin what he's saying, he's saying there basically that uh, um, racism and nationalism are in our genes. Now, if you accept that conclusion, you have to, you have to then, if you know, if you say A, B, and C, you need to say uh, D, E, and F and all the rest of the letters in the alphabet, you have to say that it's impossible to get rid of racism. It's impossible to get rid of um, sexism and, uh, and, and, all of, and nationalism and all of these sort of things. In actual fact, racism is very much bound up with the history of capitalism. Racism 
uh, really it's 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 uh it's its origins are in the last few centuries yeah, it's a so pseudo scientific justification for the enslavement of big parts of the world by europeans right yeah, slavery colonialism and so forth mm. all of this idea of a hierarchy of races and and all of this sort of stuff this was pseudo scientific justification again very much based upon the idea that there is this natural order of things you know um and so uh, yes this uh, this this these ideas of dawkins and and sociobiologists and so forth are just the latest incarnation but in actual fact they they are extremely reductionist this there's a very linear line of causality the genes uh, uh, are what cause the 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 phenotype the organism basically and that in turn we we as a society are nothing more than the sum of our parts basically so if you see war and greed in society it's because the individual is naturally warlike and greedy what it misses out is precisely actually the interaction there's an interaction between genes and environment between individuals uh, um, between social classes and so forth and selection takes place of course at many different levels one side of of uh, of the pro of, of of biological evolution is of course precisely um the, the 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 struggle for of for the survival of the fittest but you also have within nature cooperation uh symbiosis and so forth well, so human even beings within... in particular i mean we're not a particularly strong or fast species the advantage that we have is that we're clever and we're able to cooperate human beings wouldn't have got very far at all if they weren't capable of cooperating of course if you take if you take one human being and uh drop them in a in, a, in an environment which is completely uh, alien to them they will probably perish very quickly you take uh 10 or 20 of them and put them into the same environment and no doubt they'll be at the top of the food chain in a very short space of time because uh of course our our this this comes on i think precisely to what actually makes human nature different there have been many different social systems over the course of human civilization many different moralities many different ruling classes but do marxists think there is such a thing as human nature well, I think that's a, a good question. I think Marxists do not deny that there is a human nature, but uh, that human nature is is constantly undergoing a process of change. Um, and uh, Marx had a, a, a wonderful quote in the in the Poverty of Philosophy, one of his early writings, where he said, "All history is nothing but a continuous transformation of human nature." And I very much like that um, because it precisely, I think, uh, gets to the bottom of what actually distinguishes human beings from the animal kingdom, whereas animals take the world as it is um they 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 use the the the, the food and the resources that, that that nature around them provides we as human beings uh, subject nature to the process of labor uh, we transform the world precisely in order to satisfy our needs like animals we have natural needs but we in satisfying them we transform the world and we transform our conditions which mold us which make us what we are and we give rise to new needs um, and therefore, in giving rise to these new needs, uh, we also change our nature. And um, this, uh, th this, this is a, a key difference with uh, the animal kingdom is precisely the fact that we develop the means of production. We, through this process of labor, which is a social process, uh, we, and we have to enter into cooperation with one another in order to uh, develop the means of production. Uh, labor is very much a social process uh, uh, as well and there are social relations which uh, corresponds to the development of the means of production at a certain stage the uh, the, the the stone axe and uh, hunting and gathering as a mode of production corresponds precisely to the the, the primitive communistic tribal society that uh, existed for hundreds of thousands of years when you have the development of the uh, the, the plow uh, the horse drawn plow or the cattle drawn plow you have the uh, the de development of uh, of agriculture on a large scale in the neolithic revolution and with the uh, um with the development of the steam engine you have industrial capitalism so we we develop these uh, uh, certain relations with each other we enter into relations with one another um based upon um our our needs but those relations have already in a certain sense been fixed by the time we're born mm. we create uh, the world around us but the world around us then is uh, is taken as a given for any generation it's the product of of, of many many um, many many generations of development mm. and uh, there is a certain there is a certain um, conservatism within that I would say um, when a certain social system has arisen on the basis of a certain development of the means of production every society takes it more or less as a, as, a, as a fixed um, as a fixed system uh, taken and given for, for all time but of course, as society develops on the basis of those relationships, um, it's, you see that uh, 
the, the development of the means of production enters into contradiction with the uh, uh, the old the old social system basically and that's when you have crises you have revolutions it's precisely actually because being quite conservative we hold on to the old ways as far as possible that that, that we arrive at a point where it's no longer to go uh, possible to go on living in the old way and revolutions become inevitable it becomes necessary to overthrow completely scrap the old uh, uh, um, uh, the old mode of production to, to 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 revolt against it and a revolutionary uh, uh, transformation of society becomes an absolute necessity what comes next what do marxists what do communists see as the next step for human nature where is it going to go in the future how will it change in the future how do we hope it will change in the future at the very least the point about how how human nature is transformed is that uh, we don't merely transform human nature by having uh, good ethics professors or uh, moralists who are going to reform human morals that's not how morality that's not how morality changes that's not how human nature changes it's in practice that uh, we transform ourselves just as it's it's precisely we have created this human nature by creating the world around us and that in turn has transformed us um it's it's through precisely practice and revolutionary struggle in particular by the working class that the working class is going to transform itself and as as marx ex explained it uh, rid itself of all the muck of ages and become fitted to found society anew it's in revolutions that all of this because you have a, a proletarian morality um, of, of the idea of solidarity in struggle and so forth i don't wish to present the working class as angels of course we all know that there are there are prejudices that seep down into all layers of society and also affect the working class and in particularly in the absence of a decent uh, revolutionary working class leadership that can give some alternative of course demagogues that promote racism xenophobia and distort that class anger that exists within the working class beyond all recognition and try to try to turn that anger against the uh, immigrants against whoever else in all these culture war manifestations of this sort of anger that's distorted um that that exists of course all of those prejudices exist and actually to be honest if we uh, if we take any working class that has entered into a revolution a revolutionary process in history that they weren't angels either the russian working class in 1917 they weren't angels they were uh, the worker in russia in in 1917 before the revolution they would have been largely illiterate they would have been second generation peasants on a very low cultural level that and uh, they would have been russian orthodox uh, christians for the most part um, and their attitude towards their, their their wives and their children would have been one of uh, that they regard them as basically private property. Mm. Yeah, Lenin like, was very upfront about that. He was very upfront about the reality of the character of the Russian working class at that time. Of course, the working class, particularly in normal times, is going to bear all of the prejudices of the, the the society around them. Those those prejudices, of course, will cling to to every every person, every individual. Um, but it's precisely in revolutions that that people transform themselves in trying to transform society. They, they revolutions are those periods. They're almost like seismic shifts in consciousness, where all of those prejudices you've maybe held on to for years maybe have have been even passed on through generations. They they no longer it's no longer even possible to hold on to those prejudices. Mm. So crying have the contradictions become that. Uh, that's when that's when consciousness quite often very a very conservative thing can become fluid can begin to shift and people can begin to reassess how they relate to one another their, their morality and and all of the rest of it and transform transform themselves precisely in those revolutionary upheavals where where masses of people uh, enter into struggle for the first well time. it's a dual process isn't it because in the course of revolution of course you're massively questioning the status quo you're for the first time in your life, probably, unless you've been lucky enough to be in multiple revolutions, you're intervening in your own destiny and you're questioning everything. But at the same time, if you don't hang together, you hang separately. So you might not like somebody else on the picket line or on the barricade or in the mass protest, on the demonstration, because they're of a different race, because they're a woman, because they're gay or what have you. But the fact is practically you have to hand together you have to strike as one and in the course of common struggle you see those prejudices undermined and there are plenty of stories throughout history where this has happened yeah i think that uh, it's quite clear that uh, there are many examples all not not just revolutions but strikes i mean you can think of a revolution as like the strike a strike on the scale of the whole of society right and uh, anyone who's been in a strike will see that workers that, that 
week a few weeks before were uh, extremely meek and mild uh suddenly are able to stand 10 feet tall when and, and uh, confront the boss when uh, when they feel that they've got the, the the strength of their their co-workers united and collective behind them sort of thing um you see you see that on a small scale in every single strike but in a revolution you see that transformation taking place on the on the scale of the whole of uh, of society um, I, re I remember the uh, the Arab Spring unfolding uh, on television screens. On uh, you watch Al Jazeera in 2010, 2011. You, these incredible scenes uh, unfolding in Tahrir Square, um, and you had uh, Coptic Christians uh, protecting um, revolutionary Mus Muslims who were on who were also occupying Tahrir Square when it came to the time for prayer. The, the Christians were guarding them against the thugs of the regime. They were so vulnerable forth. while they were um, yeah. prostrating. Yeah. Course. So, so the uh, and, and those different uh, religious groups and so forth that would have been uh, pitted against one another, of course, by the ruling class. All right. Final question: How do we think human nature might look under communism, a society where you've eradicated social classes, exploitation, oppression, the state, money, etc.? How will humans behave? Well, I think that, the, first of all, in, in many respects, we don't want to get too far into the realm of uh, speculation. Um, I think that the socialist society, of course, well, in many respects, it's born out of capitalism. It will bear the birthmarks of the society that went before it. We're not saying that, of course, that by uh, overthrowing capitalism, that we will immediately do away with all of the prejudice and everything that goes along with capitalism. But I think we will have cut the root precisely of all of the uh, um, all of the um, the whole legacy of class society and all of the horrors that have been associated with it. And I think we will it will lay the material basis for a society in which there is no exploitation, there is no oppression, and so forth. Um, just to bring it back to that initial question, is communism against human nature? Well, I think that the first thing is that uh, actually communism is in the best interests of the vast majority of humanity, which is the working class, the proletariat, which makes up the big majority of, of humanity these days. And far from that being uh, against human nature, we've seen that, uh, that the working class has shown the spirit for sacrifice, the spirit of... Uh, of uh, a fighting spirit in the past few years, which is uh, incredibly inspiring. The events of the Sudanese revolution, the Sri Lankan revolution last year, the, the revolutionary events in, in Latin America and Chile, the fight back against the coup against Castillo. The movement Peru. in Iran as well. The movement in Iran, of course, incredi an incredible self-sacrificing movement um, against a brutal regime, which has, uh, has, has executed dozens of, uh, of revolutionaries in the past year. Um, and uh, so the, the the working class has shown it is willing to fight and it is it is willing to die for this cause in many countries. Um, how can you explain that with this idea? Human nature is is this greedy thing, and we are we're only looking out for our own survival and self advancement. It of course it's uh, it's a, it's a myth, it's a fiction which is designed precisely to uh, uh, to justify the uh, the existence of capitalism and the immutability of capitalism but far from being immutable this system is 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 in crisis is is it's racked with uh, um it, it's it's racked with uh, uh crisis and it's it, it's staggering from one crisis to another and consciousness is beginning to transform that the a molecular process of change is taking place in the working class and this is preparing the way for a a, ser a revolution a worldwide revolutionary epoch that we're entering into and this is precisely in an epoch of revolution that working class people transform themselves. Going through these struggles, they learn the lessons of these struggles and they see the value precisely of standing together, fighting as a class and their international interests as a proletariat. But to, to move on to the question, once we've done away with this system, what will become of human nature? Well, I think it will be a, it will be a leap into, as, as Engels described it, a leap from the realm of necessity to the realm of freedom. When for the first time, actually, we as human beings as a species will collectively control our entire future and our destiny. We won't be subject to, we will, we will bring our economic forces under our full control and we'll be able to plan precisely where we as a society advance to artistically, scientifically. Uh, it, will it be space exploration? Will it be uh, completely remodeling cities and, and, and the, the, the living conditions in which human beings uh, um, uh, live under? And we will free up the, the, the time of millions of people whose 
whose daily lives are, for the vast majority, are merely a struggle to get to the end of the month in terms of paying the bills, are merely a struggle to feed themselves. When you take that away, um, that is the basis of this 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 dog eat dog survival. Is is it's uh, it's poverty and it's scarcity. That's the basis of this uh, uh, this this animalistic human nature. This this struggle for this brutality, this brutishness of capitalism and all of class society is precisely scarcity. Once we do away with scarcity, once we have a society of, uh, of superabundance, for the first time in human history, it will represent the biggest revolution in, in human nature, or it will lay the basis for the biggest revolution in human nature that we as a species have ever uh, experienced. The doing away, first of all, it will cut at the root, the basis of all kinds of prejudice, racism, uh, and sexism, xenophobia, and so forth. And it will lay the basis for a complete revolution in, uh, in, in us as human beings and our relations to one another. They, they will become truly human relations rather than relations based upon what we can get from one another. Um, but as Engels said, in actual fact, those future generations will care very little what we think that they, how the, we think they should do things and what we think their nature will look like. The point is we will allow those future generations precisely to develop from themselves a new human nature and, and develop that human nature in a much more conscious way than, than generations before. Uh, we, of course, as human beings, we consciously create the world around us by th we, we consciously engage in the production process. But the outcome of that is something that no one has planned. But for the first time now, collectively, on the basis of a, 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 a democratic socialist plan of production on a world scale, we will plan how we transform the conditions in the world in such a way as to also transform ourselves. We will have a, we will gain a certain control even over how we manipulate human nature that has never existed for previous generations. We will bring human nature under our conscious control to a much greater degree, if that makes sense. Um, so yeah, uh, in, in, in many respects, that will be up to the future generations to decide that. We, the task of our generation is to lay the basis for that, uh, those, to, for the opening up of those vistas for, for humanity um, through the communist revolution and all of history and the, the, particularly the, the history of the past century shows that, that the, uh, the working class is capable under the, re the correct revolutionary leadership of, of breaking with this system. Uh, we don't have to question the capacity of the, the working class. The question mark is really the capacity of the communists to become that factor that can uh, that can give the working class the leadership it needs to to make that break um, in human history. Well, there you have it. Thank you very much, Ben. And hopefully now those listening will have all the ammunition that you need to deal with this often quite tediously posed question of whether communism is against human nature, or at the very least, you can direct the people who asked that question to this episode. Ben, one more time. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Joe. And I'll see you all next week.